Okay, welcome back. We're gonna, like I mentioned, to finish up the last set of the notes uh, for boundary layer flows. And now that we've gone to the trouble to try and look at some basic relations, I wanna try and close the loop and recover some important equations that just have to hold um, based on these basic important experiments and insights from Prandtl and von Karman. And we're gonna look and try and find the relations for the viscous sublayer the inner layer and the outer layer. And we'll actually recover an equation that connects the viscous sublayer and the inner layer in one integral equation, which I think most people probably haven't seen. Um, so that will be interesting. So we're gonna first look and go back to our equations. We're gonna say we're gonna have a momentum equation in two dimensions, the flow is incompressible, it's turbulent, there's, there's a turbulence class, and we'll restrict partial p partial x to zero, or being very close to zero. That's right, and it's turbulent, so u prime that is equal, so rho is a constant, and it's 2d, right? So w is zero, the w bar. So that equation for momentum will be written this way, and we'll refer to it a few times in this class. Now, usually we're splitting apart uh, the shear, uh, the the, the fluctuations like um, uh, u u bar and u prime, or we split apart um, mu, like mu plus epsilon m. Here we're going to do something a little different. We're going to split apart the shear stress. So we'll we'll define tau now here as a total shear stress, and we'll write tau as a summation of two shear stresses, just like we had an eddy viscosity model. So this is kind of a little different. And this first term here, this is tau laminar, and we'll call this contribution to it tau turbulent. So the L is for laminar, if you haven't noticed, and the T is for turbulent. And so here, you can imagine that if we're going from a turbulent to laminar flow, like as we approach the wall, we should recover sort of a laminar flow very close to the wall. This term would go to zero, and then tau t would go to zero, and then the total shear stress would just be the standard definition. And we would recover laminar boundary layer. Now you might say, okay, well that's nice and obvious, I think, or maybe not so, but what happens if we go the other way, farther away from the wall? We've already looked at distributions of eddy viscosity and the velocity fluctuations, and as you go out into the free stream, if you have a low turbulence environment, then we would expect the turbulent fluctuations to go to zero and the Reynolds stress to go to zero. So as you exit the boundary layer by increasing y and going through you know, the outer layer and Cole's wake region, in the free stream, you would also expect this term here right, to, uh, to become small and go to zero. And once again, you recover again goes as tall laminar. So we're going to look at that too in this part of the class up next. So we're going to assume that our surface is non-porous, meaning that the flow can't go through the wall. It's not like a, um, you know, it's uh, not too rough, it's uh, smooth. And we'll say near the wall, partial tall w partial y at the wall goes to zero. U and V are very small at the wall, and as you go to the wall, they'll become zero. And now, if we recall the continuity equation, um, or DL and Bayes equation, and of course the no-slip condition, uh, because this is an Eulerian, we have a um, viscous flow, we'll take equation 3.25, and we'll differentiate respect to partial Y. Then you can show that this term with this condition here that partial 2 tau partial y squared at the wall is zero. So that's at the wall, right? So there's a little subscript w as well. So then uh, if that holds, then we can certainly write this condition. It has to hold through the layer due to equation 325. So you can see there's no sub w. So using this argument, and it's to me kind of a powerful thing because the first time I saw it, I was kind of skeptical. But this argument shows that the total, right, total tau shear stress is constant in 
this specific incompressible turbulent flow with no pressure gradient. And uh, this was written down first uh, in theory, and it was confirmed experimentally. So this is another time when people doing the math said this is probably true and it caused some people to get some research funds and confirm it. So uh, let's look at one type of graph just to get an idea. This is the dimension of shear stress distribution across the boundary layer. So this is really this term here, right? Three, two, six across the boundary layer and it's normalized by u sub e squared, right, which has units of meters squared per second squared, so that checks out. And once again, we have non-dimensional distance from the wall with the boundary layer thickness, and there's the boundary layer edge. Now you can see this is a pretty small value, 0 0.001, 2, and 3. So one thing to notice right away is that non-dimensionally it's small, uh, this whole axis. So it's pretty small variation um, if you count for it that way. And this is also from Klebanoff's work. And uh, this is one way to write the shear stress. So we have ta t, that's the turbulent shear stress, divided by rho ue squared. Goes as negative 2u prime v prime, that's the Reynolds stress, over ue squared. So this equation is the one that's really holding across the boundary layer. So near y over delta of 0 0.1 to 0 0.2, the turbulent shear stress is nearly constant. So that's uh, obviously from the data in this region here. It's an engineering approximation. You can see it's not truly constant, but it has very, very, very small variation. Okay. Here's some things I've just written out in full and uh, to save me writing. I note as the walls approach, the turbulent shear stress goes to zero. And uh, that's shown by different experiments. And that's shown in figure three, two, one. So look at this figure. This is shown in outer coordinates, right? And doesn't really say what's happening near the wall, which is this region. That's why we like to plot things in inner coordinates. So let's look at that figure in three, two, one. So they've still plotted in this figure y over delta, but you can see now it's just in the region from 0 to 0 0.03. And here's the inner coordinates of y plus. So this is the inner coordinate. And uh, now we have uh, these ways of plotting Reynolds stress. And you can see for y plus maybe 0 to 10, this is normally what? The viscous subregion. Or layer. And uh, you can see going from the wall, it is relatively constant. And then it comes out to be a relatively constant here. So when you plot it at inner coordinates, when you get really, really close to the wall, you could almost make a nice approximation that it's linear from the wall. It must go to zero from the wall because there's no velocity fluctuations at the wall. And it can go to a constant. So you can see in this region, um, the shear stress increases in a way that the total shear stress distribution is constant in this region. And uh, that's certainly true according to equation 327, which we just showed. So those are some of your measurements to try and argue that they were correct. Um, another thing, uh, which is important in aerospace engineering at least, is skin friction, which is usually sought by aerodynamicists to predict drag shows that the value of the dimension of laminar shear stress at the wall uh, where tau t is zero goes as this equation. And so this is at the wall. Oh, I'm sorry, what am I doing? This is at the edge. Because I can raise that to that. Now, if we take 
equation 327, let's go back here, and we go to a region of constant shear stress, say tau is constant, which is tau plus tau t, we can integrate, and we'll get 329 right here. So this equation shows that the variation with y is known, or if the relationship of, say, negative u prime v prime bar is known relative to the mean flow. Whew. Then equation 3, 2, 9 can be integrated to obtain the velocity distribution in the constant shear region. So this little equation is important. And you can see this right-hand side here, if you set it to the wall, you recover friction velocity, which is what we've pretty much collapsed all our data with before. Um, so that's actually where you might argue that you know, mathematically, you would find a friction velocity and use it for scaling for, for say, velocities like u plus and y plus. So we're going to take uh, 3, 2, 9 and the first equations of this lec lecture and apply them to each region of the boundary layer and find some super important relations that should hold for pretty much all the turbulence models that are applied to, say, like boundary layer flows that are turbulent and incompressible. Okay. So we'll note that the viscous sublayer, right, which is that region really, really close to the wall in typical boundary layers, is on the order of, say, 0 0.1 to a maximum of 1% of uh, the thickness, the total boundary layer thickness. So when you think about it, it's really tiny. And as when you increase Reynolds' number, it's going to become even smaller. So there's only a really small little part of the boundary layer where um, our, our turbulent stresses, tau sub t, are going to be small, and your viscous forces dominate. So if we take equation 3, 2, 9, and we say negative u prime v prime bar is about 0 at the wall, you'll get equation 3.30. And this is not an r, this is a tau, excuse me, right, because it's at the wall. And uh, you can see that from a 3, 2, 9, I would just say, okay, this term here is very small. So I got u tau squared goes as v times partial u partial y. Okay. Now, I'm going to integrate this equation, and I will result, write the results in a non-dimensionalist form. And this, as you know, should be y plus, which we showed in the introductory part of the class. And also that's just from integrating both this side and putting in a non-dimensional form, dividing both sides by the um, uh, right friction velocity. Okay, so what does that mean? If you look at the boundary layer profile, say we have u plus, oops, excuse me, this is u plus, and this is y plus. This is uh, the viscous sublayer region. And there's the value. This is one, this is one, always. So this is a little clue too. In the fourth programming assignment, when you predict your flow and you plot it in inner coordinates, like you do a prediction and you get values of u versus y, you should be able to find the shear stress at the wall, find u tau, and uh, plot u plus versus y plus. And if you don't have a value of u plus equals y plus equals one, then you've done it wrong. So all, and this applies to uh, compressible boundary layers too, if you've normalized them correctly. 
more bond you, there's pressure gradient. I, I guess every composite profile, I think, will have u plus equals y plus equals 1 in inner coordinates. So um, that's the viscous sublayer. Now, what if we get away from the viscous sublayer, and, and maybe this is about 10 here, and you know it goes like this and becomes a log layer. What do we see then? Well, there's this inner region. And that's what we're talking about here, this inner region of the log layer. So in this inner region where the flow is fully turbulent, that laminar shear stress, tau L, is small compared to tau T. Now, tau itself should be relatively constant in this region, which you saw experimentally and from just our basic mathematical analysis. So of course, tau L, if it's small, tau T must be increasing, so the amount of stress from the turbulence and the total stress is increasing. Now let's look back at figure 321 just for a reference and you'll see that this assumptions I'm arguing about applies for y plus greater than 30. So this region here is where it'll apply because of course this is tau t. Okay so it's relatively constant so that means in this part Ta L is small and also constant. So based on these arguments, I can take equation through 2, 9 again and write this equation, 3, 3, 2. Why? Because V partial U partial Y is about 0 in that region, or very, very small relative to the other terms. So I'm just taking the highest, um, the largest terms. So yellow, the friction velocity squared goes as the negative Reynolds stress divided by density. So we're going to take uh, equation 3.7. Oh, it's down here on the notes. And uh, if you don't remember, that was our expression for eddy viscosity. All right, that was a model. And we're going to plug it into this equation here in 3.3.2. And uh, this x... Uh, I think that should be a kappa, actually. Sorry. You'll get this equation, which is nice, but it doesn't tell us much. So let's integrate it, both sides, just like we did with other ones. And we'll find 1 over kappa times ln of y plus plus c. So now Besides the hand-waving arguments that were done before, we've recovered um, the log law of the wall in a more rigorous way um, based on some arguments of experiments. So generally, C is on the order of 5, um, and that would represent the log region, which I don't have plotted right now. I think I have it plotted later. We'll just remark them again. Okay, so if we take 3, 3, 4... You can also derive it by substituting in the mixing length formula, um, which I haven't introduced yet in the class, so that's not very useful. And you can also find it um, in a similar way. So I'm going to skip this uh, part of the class because it's just sort of a little bit of extra notes. But I'll, I'll fill in the notes where you can refer them later. This is 1 over kappa y plus, and this is a Utah over kappa y. Not terribly important because I'm just recovering the same results in a slightly different way. But you can see this is another important formula. That's the log formula. I'll leave this up if you can copy it. And the other important formula so far was, of course, u plus equals y plus. So we recovered exact formulas which correspond to all these experiments. They all collapse against the log law, the viscous sublayer. Okay, so this was just some comments on the inner part of the inner layer. What if we go out a little bit more into more of a central and outside of the inner layer to what might be called the buffer layer or, you know, the coal's wake region? And uh, before I was just saying, oh, you can just like take a sine squared function and fit it continuously and capture the outer part of the turbulent boundary layer. But that's not very satisfactory to me and probably most people. So they want to kind of look at that a little bit more. 
So I also call this as something like a transition region, right? Just like we go to the wall and your fluctuations go to zero, if I go out into the free stream, my fluctuations uh, should also be going to zero. And we also noted that there's a lot of intermittency there. So these are problems we need to handle. So I'll note that Prandtl's theory and the Buzanesk Eddy viscosity in their original form apply to turbulent flows. and not transition flows. So this is really at the outer part of a boundary layer, even though it's fully turbulent, it's really transitionary. And so we might need to modify their thinking a bit for this to work. And if you're in this region, of uh, sort of the buffer region, the outer part of the boundary layer, and you approach it, you could imagine that these velocity fluctuations are approaching the levels of the velocity fluctuations in the turbulent flow. So as y becomes smaller, just as if we were a one-point statistic, we'd approach fully turbulent. That's what I mean. Now this was all noted by a uh, pretty famous uh, researcher in the community named Van Dries. I'm probably not saying his name correctly because I grew up in the Midwest of America. <laughs> and uh, he noted these things and he proposed a modification of Prandtl's theory. So let's look at his little modification. He said kappa y. That's what? That's the original mixing length theory. Right? So that's just saying the length scale, the largest length scale, the turbulence gets bigger linearly as I move away from the wall. And so he multiplied that by one. <laughs> so that's easy. So he still has the same thing. But as he goes farther away from the wall, he has one minus exp of negative y over a, where a is just some complicated coefficient. And that's it. Now, that's kind of looking like a bit of an empirical assumption, and it is, but it's a really good one, as you'll see in a few minutes, that overcomes some of these previous difficulties. A itself, right here, is defined as 26 times uh, a small value V times uh, wall shear stress divided by rho to the half power. And uh, this is for incompressible flows. You can also try and get this for non-zero pressure gradient, um, non-porous walls with compressibility. I mean, people have developed these models in research today. But this is how he modified Prandtl's turbulence closure or turbulence model for mixing length. So if we use uh, this model here and we combine it with um, way back in the mixing length formulation, and I'll, I'll note that here in a second. Um, can I get my notes right here? Yep. Okay. This, this is uh, combining it with negative rho u prime v prime bar equals rho l squared times partial u partial y partial u partial that equation. Okay. So if I substitute an l in here, um, Place back in governing equation, I get this equation 338. And uh, this is some error there. Okay. And we'll talk about the figure in just a second. Now I non dimensionalize. In inner coordinates just like I've plotted everything else, I'll get equation 3.4, excuse me, 3.39, which is right there. And I'm just putting a little bit different form and I solve for du plus over dy plus. 
So if you look at this equation, this is non-dimensional form of 338, you can see, oh, well, here's maybe an unknown variable, du plus dy plus squared plus some constant du plus dy plus a constant. So that looks like something I learned a long time ago in my K-12 system, the Detroit public school system. <laughs> I learned something in there, a value. And uh, I can solve it using something like quadratic formula. So now I have a closed form solution for du plus dy plus. And you know what? I would have never gotten that nice analytical solution if I didn't choose a nice function like the one proposed by Van Driest in 337. So even though it's not perfect, it's really, really close to the experimental data for a wide range of these flows with the given assumptions. And upon substitution, it gives me an analytic solution. So that's a wonderful thing, if you can make those choices. Now, in this equation, A has a certain value, and um, what we're going to try and do is uh, integrate both sides, right? Because I want to solve for u plus, which is my velocity with respect to y. So that's what I'm going to do. I can integrate both sides, and Van Driest has noted some of these constants. This one I recognize by heart, a plus of 26. And then um, I can integrate, and there's a few intermediate steps which you're welcome to look at, and I get u plus as a function of uh, these constants and y plus, which is the distance to the wall. Now remember at the wall, my velocity is zero, so y plus is zero. And uh, that gives me a boundary condition, uh, which helps me evaluate the constant of integration. So let's just look at 3, 4, 1 for a second and go back to this graph. So this is one we shall all recognize. Here's y plus distance. So look right away, I can see, oh, this is y plus 1, and u plus is 1 right there. So that checks off the first box. Every time I say a u plus y plus graph for my students, I say, what's the value of u plus at y plus of 1? You know, and they can check their numerics, and they say, oh, it's like, you know, 2.387, I'm like, wow. That's probably a sign that there's some error in the normalization or an error in the computational fluid dynamics because it just has to be for a lot of these cases. And once again, you have your viscous sublayer. We just re-derived that mathematically. So that's the viscous sublayer, this line here. And we also showed this line, which is the log layer, which we just developed. Remember this, this is from another reference. And uh, so that's wonderful. But then you see the experiments, the, the points, and uh, there's an extra line here. You can see this solid line here that goes through all the data from the wall through the viscous sublet region through the inner part of the inner layer all the way to the buffer layer is this one solid line. That's not a composite profile. That's the graph of this solution 3.41. So that's quite an incredible thing. So a few things to note about this. This is a continuous velocity distribution in the inner region and the viscous region of the boundary layer all the way from the wall to transition region. one equation. And it's not, you know, I guess it's empirical that you chose a length scale model, right? So, but that's like an original closure and it's analytical, right? So we found this, which matches the data really well without any use of a computer in CFD, uh, which isn't very practical if you're doing like an aircraft simulation, but I just really want to show you that this is like truly a first great turbulence model. And of course, uh, you might say, well, that's wonderful. How does it apply to real flows? Well, you could also just take the same length scale model of Van Driest and use it in a computer, right? You don't have to substitute it in equations. You just use that as another equation you solve with continuity and momentum, the boundary layer equations, with a length scale equation of Van Driest, and then you have a closed model, which you can have in CFD and it works pretty well for these conditions. 
Um, no, a funny little things about this. If we set a is zero, then this equation, 3.41, oh my gosh, sorry about that. Four one reduces to the viscous sublayer expression and which would be u plus y plus and in the fully turbulent region for b zero that's fully turbulent region and a equals x oops excuse me kappa y plus squared then it will reduce to equation 3.34. So let's go back and look at 3.34. And that is my log equation, right? So it recovers my independent laws for my viscous sublayer and my log layer by that choice of the negative exponent of uh, Van Dries' equation, which is negative y over a. And that's good. Okay, so it's uh, one o'clock. I think we can try and look at these uh, pages in the next few minutes. So we've talked, oh, I don't know if people finished copying that. Um, while you're looking at that, I'll make a few remarks. So we've talked about the viscous sublayer, the inner layer, like the log layer, and we've gone out to the transition region. And with Van Dries' uh, length scale model, we recover two of the most famous boundary layer laws. And now you might be saying, well, okay, well, what happens in the outer layer? Is there anything we can do there? And uh, people had a lot of difficulty with that because of the intermittency problem. But there's one clue uh, which helped us uh, try and find like coals um, wake region paper. And I'm just gonna try and describe that a little more mathematically now. And it's that as you go farther and farther away from the boundary layer and the outer layer and go into the flow, like I'd say y over delta, say 1.2, I'm almost like approaching what is again a laminar flow. And I also have a really important tool in my arsenal from Prandtl student Velasius. What did he do? He's really known today as someone who found the laminar boundary layer flow. And he had a third order ordinary differential equation, which has some solutions. So the idea was at the time that we might take boundary layer theory from Blasius, and we might take um, uh, these ideas of what's happening in the outer layer that returns to laminar flow and combine them and try and close the model, uh, if you will, to recover what's happening in this Coles wake region. So um, let's just make a note of that. We know Blasius theory, and we know flow is approaching laminar conditions as y goes to infinity, of course. And uh, so that's great. Now, in the convective term, we note as we approach that reading, it'll be on the same order, that's approximate order, alpha, as a shear stress gradient term at a large distance. From the wall. And that can be seen in the momentum equation and through kind of dimensional analysis or really measurements. So in this outer region we have tall laminar and it's going to be quite small in the turbulent region so compared to tall turbulent of course. And we'll just say it's about zero and we'll take that momentum equation which I introduced basically the beginning of the class and write it as 3.42. So this term is dominated by turbulence. That's cool. 
And you see I've restricted the range of this equation from some intermediate y up to the boundary layer thickness. So we're not really over, right, delta. So this is like, if here's the boundary layer, so it flows. So here's delta and here's y naught. So we're in this region. Okay. So from this equation, 3, 4, 2, we can see that in the outer region of the turbulent boundary layer, it'll have the same form as the momentum equation as the laminar boundary layer equation. Wow. So if you go back to the Navier-Stokes equations and say that they're incompressible and steady, and you write the boundary layer equations like we did in the last section on the major equations, this equation has exactly the same form, u, v, w, and instead of just saying general shear stress, we have toss of t. So it's a very, very similar form, and wow, we might be able to develop solutions for that. So um, we can illustrate the difference with the eddy viscosity concept. Okay, so what are we going to do? We're going to assume that there's an eddy viscosity epsilon sum m, and it's independent of y. So that means the eddy viscosity in this outer and wake region is relatively constant. And we saw that from the experimental graphs of Klebanoff, which I showed um, maybe just an, outer, uh, an hour ago. And that's all in the outer region. And we'll just call this maybe epsilon m as a constant. So we're going to take epsilon m and substitute it into the equation, and we'll get 3.43. Oh, and we'll need, uh, excuse me, we'll need uh, negative rho u prime v prime bar equals negative, or just rho epsilon partial u partial y, right? So that's closure model, and we'll get 3.43. So this is our new form of the momentum equation. So once again, this is identical to the laminar boundary layer equation. If we replace the kinetic viscosity with the molecular viscosity nu. Right? And, uh, you know, this fact shouldn't be lost on us because the flow should be returning the laminar type flow, just like in the viscous subregion. So it's all the shearing is creating in production and mixing turbulence within the middle of the boundary layer, not at the edges, like the top edge and near the wall. Okay, now this is where uh, someone named Clauser in 1956 came in and made some progress on these equations. And uh, if we choose a scaling variables, uh, to try and find a similarity between laminar and turbulent flow and the profiles, we can show um, that this is a new like scaling term. So before we had like y plus, now we're going to go as zeta. So this is a choice, and uh, like everything in life, we have choices, and this turns out to be a good one, as you'll see. He also used the definition of the stream function, right, from potential flow theory, and here's the stream function, dimensionless one, in terms of zeta. So zeta is a, really a function of the distance from the wall, u is the edge velocity, epsilon sum naught is a constant uh, eddy viscosity, and x is a distance along the plate. So let's draw that just so you can see. Here's your boundary layer, this is y, and zeta, and this is x, and ue is out here, right? So this wasn't just pulled out of thin air, it was actually inspired by Blasius' solution for laminar boundary layer. And here's your stream function. So this is gonna relate uh, our velocity as a function of x and y. So we're trying to solve this, of course. And if we do all this, you'll get and recover exactly the Blasius equation for laminar boundary layers, but it's for the turbulent part of the flow um, at the edge of the flow. So uh, hopefully you've seen this. This is F triple prime plus one half 
f f double prime equals zero. And this is, of course, Blasius. You can see it's a single ODE for the flow, the velocity over a laminar boundary layer, but it's also valid for a sort of a flow at the edge of the turbulent boundary layer. And you'll see this works really well. And like all ODEs, it's an ODE and it's third order. And uh, just as a tidbit, I hear that the undergrad students in Aerodynamics 1 are actually solving this equation numerically this semester, which is kind of cool. Need some boundary conditions. Well, F will be zero at the wall. So this is your wall condition. F prime will be constant at the wall. And the limit of F prime of zeta going to infinity will be one. So you have a bounded solution that way. And uh, just as a recollection, F prime, uh, the first derivative of F, that would be U over UE, which is the streamwise velocity component divided by the edge velocity. Okay. So uh, let's look at some solutions of this equation just to get used to it. This is your equation zeta, right? So that's your non-dimensional parameter. Y-axis is your first derivative of f. Why did we plot the first derivative of f? Because it's the normalized streamwise velocity component. As zeta gets bigger, all the values of f prime go to 1. So I've satisfied my boundary condition and that makes sense right because I would want ue or u over ue to go to one at the edge of the boundary layer and these are of course the wall conditions so you can see that families of solutions actually correspond to slip at the wall so there's really only one solution that might matter for say the laminar boundary layer flow solution right that's when f prime is zero Right, so that would be, I could just pull out that solution. That's my self-similar solution for laminar and compressible boundary layers. Now, what if I want to apply this solution away from the boundary layer wall? Well, away from the boundary layer wall, u over ue has to be greater than zero. So I would try and pick a solution here, which is both continuous and matches the velocity of my log layer profile. That was the idea. So a few notes about this, that it means that if there's solutions, which we're going to use to describe the mean velocity distribution in the outer layer of the turbulent boundary layer, then they should collapse into a universal or nearly universal curve as shown for composite profiles, right? So we need to, to use this, we need to put, say, a solution in a form to match the log profile. And this is why we know Clauser's name in turbulence research today, I suppose, from 1956. Okay. And uh, he chose to match it, a new, kind of just a new variable scaling as ue minus u all over ue and y over delta as his two parameters. So y over delta will be selected as 1. And um, there could be different factors to try and scale this term here, ue minus u over ue. And to really see all the details of this, you're going to have to look at Clauser's paper. I'm just going to show you the major results because I can't spend multiple classes you know, going through this. But there's really two uh, ways to kind of match this data. One is this is for the wall coordinate and this is the velocity coordinate. And uh, this here is the laminar curve. And if you take these and set u edge to be here and set the wall uh, with uh, a full velocity defect, so that'd be ue, well, it's u over ue and minus u, that'd be giving me zero uh, for a no slip wall. And by modifying this a bit, I can get a slip wall. Um, so let me just 
take these variables. I know I'm kind of going fast through this in the interest of time. We'll try and take these uh, for and match experimental velocity profiles with partial u partial y at the wall, which could be given by um, u plus equals y plus equals 1, and for zero pressure gradient. Okay, so let's just try and look at that quick. And I'll show you this um, profile down here. So by picking these variables here, which I noted above, defect layers, you can see that F prime uh, is all going to collapse a, around a, the same profiles for all those different cases. So he chose these two variables to collapse all the profiles for some variation of u minus u e. And you might often hear people call this the defect layer. And why do people call it the defect layer? Because u e is constant, and you have, say, u minus u e or u e minus u. Either way, see here it is plotted slightly different way, where you have 1 minus u e. So that's actually like a velocity defect from the edge of the boundary layer. Now, I just want to make a few, I'll let you copy that. Sometimes I think I write too fast and move too quick. You gotta tell me, slow down a tiny bit. A few notes about these figures. Um, these were confirmed first by Smith and Walker. And uh, as I noted, the Blasius solution is for f prime of 0 equals 0. And these other solutions are for the Coles wake region. OK. And um, these results. match experiment in the range of y over delta greater than 80% of the boundary layer, which is awesome. Okay. Now, earlier in the class, I showed um, Cole's wake region, and that sine squared law can be basically matched to this curve here uh, to try and match the log region with um, u sub e, basically. Um, but this is just a more, this is sort of where all that came from. Um, I don't think I'm going to talk too much more about it because we're going to be more concerned with modeling fully developed turbulence and not transitional turbulence, uh, which is hard enough. And uh, so what we're going to do on Thursday is we're going to look at the premise of algebraic models. And then uh, Tuesday next week, we're going to focus solely on the Sebecki-Smith model. So I'm going to stop that.